Hi everyone. Today you have the privilege to listen in as I have a discussion with Christy Herselman from the chat. We're going to have a discussion on a very tricky topic, uh, pornography exposure in our kids. Welcome, Christy. We are so happy to have you here. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. It's such a privilege to be with you. Oh, it's so nice to finally get to meet you. And um, yo, I think when we discussed this interview, I said to you, we're going to be talking as one warrior mom to another warrior mom. Don't you want to tell us more about your journey starting the chat? What led up to this decision to start the chat? And then also about being a mom that fights for your kids. Definitely. So my, my kids are now 16 and 14. I have a 16 year old daughter and 14 year old boys. And when my daughter was six, uh, we were at a birthday party with a, um, one of her friends and a group of us moms were sitting around as you do at those birthday parties when your kids are small and you have to stay. And um, one of the moms whispered to another mom, have you spoken to your daughter about sex? And all of us were quite shocked because we thought, yo, this is early. You know, this is so, this is a conversation for later. And I have a background in journalism, so I love research. Um, and I also love to be on the same page as the other moms so that we can, you know, be saying the same things to our children. So I went away and I researched what we should be saying, when we should be saying it, and got together with those moms in a, in a lounge uh, with a couple of glasses of wine to calm our nerves. <laughs> and uh, we chatted. And we chatted about what should we be saying? When should we be saying it? And, you know, this phrase, eight is too late, came up. And it is very, very true. Um, you know, if we haven't spoken about sex to our children by the time they're eight, someone else will have done it for us. Sure. And from that moment, um, the chat was born, the organization that I founded. Um, I don't, I call it a movement more than an organization yeah. because it basically exists to just create a healthy culture around tricky topics. Uh, so I want to just break open topics that parents don't like to talk about, um, don't feel equipped to talk about. So things like sex, things like social media, pornography, gender, identity, um, you know, those kinds of things yeah. where we as parents, we, we can avoid because either we're scared to talk about it or we don't know what we need to be saying. And so that is how I'm fighting, not only for my own children, but for the children of this generation is yeah. that they wouldn't make mistakes because no one told them. You know, every mm -hmm. teenager, every child is going to make mistakes, but let it not be because we as parents haven't equipped them. Absolutely. And so the chat exists to impart accurate information, to create homes where children feel safe to ask the tricky questions, yeah. where nothing is off the table, uh, where families feel deeply connected and children attach in a healthy way to their nuclear family rather to some random person on the internet oh, and also yeah. just so that children feel grow up feeling secure in who they are and, and can make decisions um, from a place of being grounded in knowledge and also self-worth wow that is so powerful i absolutely love it i never knew about the eight is too late thing and i feel like there's a lot that i want to know about that as well but I'm so glad that I've got a person in the room that wants to break open taboo subjects. That feels, that feels important and that feels meaningful and that feels like it's going to make change. And I like that. Um, so I've definitely got a tricky subject for you today. Um, pornography. It's a terrible, terribly tricky subject. Um, and I, I did some research on, you know, like the statistics out there and UNISA seems to be doing a lot of research on South African children and the statistics around pornography exposure, um, exposure among South African kids is quite frightening. Um, I've got two stats here. The one says the median age of pornography exposure in South Africa is 10 years of age. And then the other one says 55% of South African children watch pornography occasionally with 10% watching it every day. Now, this to me sounds like madness. It can't be real, surely, this can't be real. Yet, this is an academic study. It was done throughout South Africa. In your experience, is this study accurate? You know, um, are children really this exposed? 100%, I would say that's very accurate. Uh, I've seen similar statistics from uh, uh, sex trafficking organizations because sex trafficking and pornography are symbiotic, mm. uh, whether it's image-based online sex uh, trafficking or actual physical sex trafficking, but this is very accurate. Our children are seeing pornography from a very young age and it goes across um, socioeconomic divides, 
Um, boys are exposed and watch more than girls, uh, but girls are not immune. Um, I actually saw uh, some stats on Pornhub. So Pornhub is the one porn site, <clears throat> excuse me, that, that releases data every year. And recently I saw some data on Pornhub that says one third of all porn watched in South Africa is watched by women. So we often think that that porn is a guy problem, it's a boy problem, but it's everybody. Um, I also do a lot of work with teenage boys and so I've done informal studies with um, big groups, um, you know, about 300 at a time, um, teenage boys. 14, 15 year olds, and the statistics are similar. By that age, there's only about 5% of them who've never seen it, mm-hmm. um, with a, a, quite a large number watching it regularly, and then um, a small but significant number who believe they're addicted. And so, you know, I, I counseled an eight year old girl the other day who'd been watching pornography um, regularly. Um, and it's heartbreaking. It was, it, it's absolutely heartbreaking because she hadn't been equipped. Mm -mm. Um, You know, a a little while ago, one of my sons was exposed to pornography in the form of a nude of a 13 year old girl that someone showed him next to the sports field. And when we were talking it through afterwards, he said, mom, I was shocked, but I was not surprised. And I feel like so many of our children are being taken by surprise. And when you're taken by surprise, you're not equipped in how to deal with it. You don't, you don't have the skills, you, it, you're so shocked by it, and we'll talk about what it does to our brain later, but you just, because we, as humans, we are sexual creatures, our body responds in a way that we don't understand, even though we are shocked and appalled by what we see, and then our children just get drawn in, and it's almost like lambs to the slaughter. They, they, they don't have defenses against it. As I explained to this little girl, it was almost like she's a little fish swimming in the sea, and she sees this interesting looking um, little morsel to eat. And she goes and like, just takes a bite because she's like, what is this? It looks interesting. And inside it is a big fat hook mm. that she didn't know was there. Yeah, yeah, and if the parents good. didn't didn't say to her, look out for these yes, for the hook. Um, interesting looking things, there's a, don't go near them, they're dangerous, then she's not to blame because yeah. she didn't know. Yeah. Um, you know, and I often think of pornography as do you remember that story we probably learned in history, Greek history of the Trojan horse? Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. So when I when I think about pornography specifically with children, but also with adults, is that it's almost like the Trojan horse. So um, you know, the Troy was the city with walls around it, and Greece wanted to invade. Yeah. And so they couldn't get through the walls. So what they did is they they built this beautiful, interesting looking horse and put all their soldiers inside and went up to the gates, and then Troy opened their gates. Mm-hmm. The horse went inside and once the gates were closed, all the soldiers got out and started killing people. Porn's exactly the same. Um, You know, a statistic from Common Sense Media says now that between 80 to 90% of young adults see pornography in a positive or a neutral light. Mm-hmm. Okay, so oh, this is beautiful. This is interesting. This mm. is this Shiny. is a gift to us. This, mm. this is sex positive. This is going to mm. educate us. This is going to spice up my marriage. This oh, is going to yeah. keep me from getting lonely. This is going to help boys in their teenage years. And then once we hit click, once we hit view, once we open the doors of that into our lives, all those soldiers start jumping out. The, st- the stats of the first generation who've grown up with porn in their pockets are showing us that it's killing our young people. It's killing their marriages. It's killing their sex lives. It's killing their self-esteem. Um, it's killing their their dating, their relationships, their bodies. Mm-hmm. But the unfortunate thing is we're not seeing porn for what it is. Mm-hmm. A lot of us are thinking that it is um, harmless. Yes. And, and, and also, um, I just want to add <clears> to that <throat> identity. You know, like if, if you grew up, if your first exposure to sex is pornography what does that do to your identity and your expectations of yourself um but um what i actually wanted to ask is so i mean i mean the first time i saw pornography was when i was in holland as a 23 year old and i went into the red light district and i was in a museum in the red light district and that's the first time i saw pornography you know 23 years old so Mm. i think as parents we probably have a bit of a naive idea of what our kids are seeing. Because when 
when I speak to my husband or I say to him, oh, what's the first time you saw pornography? He says to me that the barber used to have scope magazines. Um, and the scope magazine had like strategic stars placed everywhere, you know, and in that, in those days, that was considered pornography. But I think most TikTok videos today would have been considered pornography back then. So what is, you know, I think our kids are seeing pornography that is a lot more extreme than what we realize. What, what is your opinion yeah. on that? Yeah, no, you're so right. So, um, a some research I saw the other day said that about that teenagers are exposed to about 15,000 sexual references a year. So that's more than a thousand times a month they see something sexual. And a lot of that is on TikTok. Yeah. That a is. lot of it's on TikTok, it's on Instagram, it's on billboards. But like you said, the content is very different. So not only is the quantity different, the content is different. So if we just look at quantity, uh, you know, when I was growing up, uh, Playboy magazine was the big uh, porn giant of the time. Mm. And it had about 15, 000, uh, 15 million subscribers. But you literally had to subscribe. It got posted to your house, wrapped in plastic. Yes. You opened it and you looked at it, okay? And then like you said, in, in South Africa, we had Scope magazine, or it was a was a was a VCR at the back of some yeah. dad's cupboard that you would take out and sneakily watch, um, you know, the boys. And and I remember my first exposure to porn was that, and and it was like a split second before I jumped off the couch and ran out the room because yeah. I got such a fright. Yeah. Um, but now, uh, Pornhub, like I said, they release their their statistics every year, and last year they had um, about 140 million views a day. So that's one porn site. There are thousands of porn sites. Um, so compare 15 million a year to 140 million a day Jeez. on one site. So porn is everywhere. Um, it's, it's actually um, hard for our children to avoid it rather than hard for them to, to find get their it. hands on it. Yeah. It's embedded in TikTok videos. Mm -hmm. um, it is, uh, you know, links are sent to them on DMs from, you know, OnlyFans pages yeah. on their um, Instagram DMs. Twitter is full of it. I, I saw something the other day that said a third of Twitter is porn. So it is um, Reddit full of porn. Um, you know, all of these spaces where our children, uh, Roblox, there's, there's a porn game within Roblox. Um, and so, you know, there, there's, there's porn on, um, on every single child's game. I mean, we could sit here and I could go through game by game to tell you where all the porn is, but it is everywhere. And then not only is it how much they're exposed to and how easily, but it's what they're being exposed mm. to. So it's not pretty girls with no clothes on with stars on their breasts. Um, okay. It is because porn is an addiction. Um, you know, experts talk about the porn creation, adult content creation industry as being in a porn arms race okay. in a race to create ever more extreme content to feed this beast because yeah. uh, um, when you watch porn what you watch at first um, becomes very boring very quickly and you have to move on to more and more so so the internet is just when you thought you couldn't see anything more awful more criminal more extreme something will be will come up and so i mean i wish there there's so much stuff i wish i'd, I'd never heard of I mean, I don't go, some some researchers actually go and look at the content. I can't bring myself no. to do that. I just read about what the content yes. is that's out there. Um, and the vast majority of porn is violent. Mm -hmm. The statistics range between 80 to 90% of porn is violence in nature. So it's women being dominated mm -hmm. by men, usually violently, um, including punching, spitting, slapping, hurting and the and then the woman enjoying that scenario so she has a she has a um a picture of a, an expression of enjoyment on her face okay um so it's that it's um it's degrading mm -hmm. um it, it feeds very much into racial stereotypes okay. so the amount of racism on pornography would never be allowed anywhere yeah. else in the world but black women, um, you know, Latin American women, you know, how they are belittled and, um, you know, the kind of enslaved and, and those kinds of things. We wouldn't allow it anywhere else, but somehow pornography gets a, a gets free a free boss. go at these yeah. things. And then the other two most watched genres are incest. Um, so sex within families 
and um, and child pornography. Um, so this idea of old men with twelve year old girls, thirteen oh. year old girls, um, and and there's even this move now to change the the um, the label pedophile to minor attracted person, as if it's what? kind of become like a lifestyle choice now or no. a sexual choice. Because it's so extreme, it just keeps going. Um, it's on this train track to, to to just worse and worse and worse and things that you can't even imagine would be okay. And we are seeing children as young as eight, nine, ten, watching these things. And as you said, um, you know, there's a psychological term called the law of first mention, which basically means the first time we're exposed to a, mm. um, a topic becomes our grit. Yes. So we have this double whammy of parents not talking to their children about the beautiful version of sex, the healthy yes. version of sex, the, 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 the one that, you know, the human body is actually created for. Yes. And, and then because they don't have that, this becomes their grit. Yes. And, and that, this becomes what they reality. expect sex to be. Yes, and, and if that's your first exposure, then, uh, like, if violent pornography is your first exposure, is that not what you're going to try in your first relationship or in your first, um, yeah, in your, the first time you have sex, is, it, is that not going to be what you want to try? Because I even read that there's a link between um, the pornography exposure that our kids are um, exposed, the pornography that our kids are exposed to and peer-on-peer -peer sexual abuse. Um, yeah. Because it's sort of like a monkey see, monkey do scenario. It, it, and your yeah. comments on that? Absolutely. So uh, Billie Eilish, um, a couple of years ago, bravely came out, uh, went public with her porn addiction. Um, she was 19 at the time, and she'd been exposed to porn at 12. Um, and interestingly, boys watch porn out of curiosity and because it's kind of what boys do. Girls generally will watch pornography to see what boys want from them. And so this was, this was her experience. Well, she watched this from 12. So then when she became sexually active, she was saying yes to these very dangerous, very violent things. That, and she thought there was something wrong with her for not enjoying them. And it took her 12, uh, sorry, seven years to come to a place where, number one, she was addicted to pornography, but she was also, you know, caught up in this very ugly version of sex. Mm. Um, and we're seeing this all the time. We're seeing a huge increase in teen on teen sexual violence and sexual domination um, with um, even on TikTok videos. Uh, there was a video trend recently of hold your girlfriend by her throat while you kiss her. Oh. So kind of the porn industry shaping yes. the social media spaces. Yes. Um, and then um, also just boys wanting to do these things to girls that they're seeing on porn. Um, a lot of um, boys wanting to, to hurt girls. Um, and also just things like... Um, you know, just mimicking what they're seeing. Um, you know, a little while ago, there was a story in the paper about um, uh, five-year-olds in America in a in a preschool where the, the 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 boys were forcing a little girl to do a sex act on one of the boys, and they'd taken one of the school iPads and they were filming it. And so, where does that whole scenario come from? Yeah. How do you know about the sex act and how do you know about filming it? Yeah. You know because you've seen porn. Yes. And so they're acting these things out um, on one another. Um, you know, there's there's also, and you know, masturbation is a very hotly contested topic. Um, and we're not going to talk about that today. But there is this, we're seeing this thing of, of masturbation starting very young. Mm -hmm. um, and almost sexual awakening starting very young Early, um, yeah. because of this um, society telling us that porn and masturbation is just good self-care. And, and so children seeing it, you know, 10, 11, 12 year olds seeing this and, and then, you know, as we're exposed to pornography, it, it sexualizes children early. early. Um, they, they, you know, because it because it kind of like releases those hormones in their bodies, even though they're not ready for them. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, because of the addiction factor, they um, they go back and they watch again and again, and then it shapes their neuro pathways around these topics. And then there's, you know, and there, there are two big things about very early exposure to pornography. The one is that it it, it creates intense trauma mm -hmm. in young children. 
because some of them have never even heard of sex yes. and then they're exposed to yes. this and it traumatizes them mm. and they carry that trauma into their adult sexual relationships and they actually don't want to have sex they don't they don't even want to talk about that they, they you know it's just mm. it's just caused such deep trauma in them and then the other thing is there's a high correlation between child porn exposure and sexual deviance and sexual criminality in adults so there are huge impacts of especially our young children being exposed to porn and what about identity tell me you you're an expert on gender identity and um what what does porn do because i mean when you're watching when you're exposed to all these different types of roles that you can play um in pornography um what does that do to a young person's because i mean at the age of you know 11 12 13 14 that's when you are trying to find out who you are in the world um, so mm. what does that do to identity? Um, yeah, so many different things, but one, one thing it, it does do is that it teaches boys that they need to dominate and dominate violently. And it teaches them that sex is all about their pleasure. Mm. And it teaches girls that they need to submit to whatever boys want from them and that their job is to pleasure the woman's role is to pleasure the man. The man's role is to be pleasured by the woman. And that women get their pleasure from making sure that the man is satisfied. So, and and one of the big things is um, because so much sex, um, so much sex on porn is violent mm. and non-consensual and shows women enjoying non-consensual sex, it is having a huge impact on consent. Mm. So, um, it tells it tells boys that when girls say no, they're just playing hard to get. And it tells girls that they don't have the right to say no because a boy's job is to, and a man's job is to dominate a woman. And that if she wants to show love to a guy or she wants to, um, to do what, if she wants to play her role in the relationship in a positive way, she needs to please him. Oh. And so you can imagine the trajectory that this yeah. takes woman yeah. on. So if, if even, even grown women, if we just go, you know, to, to adult women for a second, it tells them that if your husband cheats, if your husband watches porn, it's because you haven't satisfied him. And it also tells you as a woman that your sexual pleasure doesn't matter. Mm. Do you know what I mean? That, that so our, our job is to satisfy the man. Yes. And also what it, what it tells um, men is that when girls say no, just keep pushing because eventually she'll cave. And that is and definitely so it's what we're seeing. Very dangerous things. And that is definitely what kids are telling me. I mean, when I work with adolescents, I've just been working with a group of grade eight and we spoke about sexting and the girls say they don't ask, the boys aren't asking once for a naked image. They're asking four times a day. And eventually, mm. if your boyfriend is a cool guy and you want to impress him, and he's asking you four times a day, the fear that you're going to be, get broken up with or that um, he's going to ridicule you or, you know, that pushes you to actually then cave in and send the nudes. And that has yeah. to, that's, that's to do with this whole culture of like pleasing and, um, and the women's role in, in, in the situation. So yes, they yeah. don't take no for an answer. They, you know, the, the boys aren't taking no for an answer. And um, it's because they're being taught that by what they're watching. Yeah. Can I add one thing to that? Is the other thing that we that it's perpetuating is objectification. Mm. So in the porn scenario, women are one hundred percent an object. Mm -hmm. um, their their personality, their likes, their dislikes. It's got there's there's no value on that whatsoever. And so that is what we're seeing in in um, in relationships is that women are being hugely objectified by men. And what's happening then is we're seeing women. It's almost, and, and this is just my observation, <clears throat> I'm not a psychologist, but this is what I'm thinking is happening with young girls is they're saying, well, if men are gonna objectify us, I'm gonna rather objectify myself because then I have the power. Mm. And so what they do is we see a lot of girls actually sending unsolicited nudes to boys. Um, you know, to shock them, to get their attention, um, that kind of thing. And then we're also seeing, uh, you know, I, I'm speaking at a, a like a, a girls' high school next week where girls are selling their naked pictures, teenage girls are selling their naked pictures on OnlyFans to make money. So it's kind of like if my body is seen as an object anyway, I then let me use it, it. Yes. to my advantage. 
and, um, and which is have some sort of control, have some sort of control yeah. of the situation. Yeah. And do you think that's coming from a deep place of insecurity? Definitely. Definitely. Um, I almost, you know, you, you see some of these social media influencer girls who are saying, you know, use your body mm. to get the guy you want to get him to buy you drinks, you know, and I even see girl, these influencers saying, um, girl, you won't have to work a day in your life, you know, just use your body to get the guy you want. And then you can just chill. I feel like we're going back to the 1950s. Have we not been fighting yes. for women, yes. women's independence and for so long and now we want to go back to being dependent on guys it's it's heartbreaking and it does come from insecurity and it comes from um you know there's six six girls sending this guy nudes i better make sure it's a good one when i send mine because that's how i'm going to get him and it's a it's a deep lack of self-worth and it's this lie that their bodies don't mean anything you know because our culture is telling us that your body is just expendable yeah. that the real yeah. you lives inside yeah do you know what i mean yeah. and we put so little value on our bodies and so yeah. we i'm seeing girls saying oh, but it's just my body it's just my body but you your body and your mind and your emotions are so deeply connected you cannot separate them and so we cause ourselves trauma when we try yeah, it, it is so, it's actually so scary. You know, um, listening to you, what came to mind to me is not, if we just put pornography aside and we just look at the music industry and we just look at what music album covers. So I've got a big problem in my car because the album cover appears on the screen and I've got two little impressionable girls trying to go through their identity forming years with these music um, covers that are incredibly objectifying um, and yeah. incredibly sexual and the men mm. you know the the male artists they don't have, they're not like bending over on a beach on their music cover mm. but <laughs> the, the female artists seem to have to do that to get yeah. their attention um, and what yeah. are we teaching? You know, I'm not even talking lyrics. I mean, lyrics is a whole different ballgame. Yeah. But I mean, I think this this thing is ingrained in our culture. It's ingrained in mm. the culture that our kids are growing up in. Mm. No, you're so right. And it actually brings to mind um, an interview that I, I was listening to not so long ago about a girl who um, she was trafficked. Well, she went into, um, first of all, she became a stripper and then she was trafficked into sex uh, work and then into pornography. And she was telling her story and she said she didn't have a dad around when she was growing up. And uh, when she was about 12, she became obsessed with rap. She just loved rap music. She grew up listening to it. But she said video after video after video in rap um, music, it shows the man being powerful yes. and rich the woman yes. usually multiple women being accessories there to make him look and feel good yes. and so she said so then when i walked into a strip club and that exact thing was being played out i was like oh yeah i know this this is normal this is this is how the world works is i'm the commodity mm -hmm. they are the buyers i am the product and they are the consumers and that's how the world works and so as young people especially without um parents speaking into it or strong male role models who will teach our girls mm -hmm. their worth they buy into that and they think that is how that that is their role in the world absolutely so i was a very curious teenager i was a very curious teenager and i'm not afraid to admit it i was the the teenager who um if i heard a dirty word then i would immediately go home open the dictionary search for that word and you know try to figure out what it means um, but back then you know that word didn't come with a plethora of videos and images and the most extreme of that word um so I mean, I know kids are quite curious um, and some parents will just brush off their kids' um, pornography habits and say, you know what, he's a teenage boy, this too shall pass, this is just a phase. Um, do you think that pornography is something that one can just sit out and hope for the best? Uh, that's such a good question and I think it's a it's one that a lot of parents um, <clears throat> struggle with and even if I go back to that birthday party when the chat was born uh, mm -hmm. the the responses from moms just around talking about sex was a lot of them were indifferent they were oh you know I found out from my older sister or from there or whatever and I was fine 
uh, or others are like, no, I just can't even talk about that. But the reality is we can't raise our children like our parents raised us because that world doesn't exist anymore. It's gone. It's not the same place. Mm -hmm. And so if we, if we think that our children will find themselves in some very tricky places, and I definitely don't think uh, we can sit this one out. Mm -hmm. You know, I was, you know, I was, I was the same, but when I was growing up, you know, you had, my parents had the Encyclopedia Britannica, <laughs> you know, all those encyclopedias. And then we had the library and the dictionary. Well, and that, that was, was it. Your, that I, was I, well, I had my sister. Oh, I'd ask my sister because she had, I had an older sister. That was where I could find my information. And now it just takes one Google search yeah. to take children into um, some very dark places. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the reality is the internet has no shallow end. So there's no like, here's the, the, here's the kiddie pool internet. Here's the Olympic size, mm -hmm. you know, for, for very strong swimmers internet. It does not work like that. Once we hand our children a, a smartphone, we literally open a door into the world for them. Mm. Good, bad, ugly, and everything in between. And so, um, you know, as you as you were speaking, I was I was thinking about this family. This boy was, um, I think they had, they had three kids, and at the time, I think they were like grade five uh, or grade three, grade five, and grade eight. And um, they had bought my book. I've written this book called The Chats, Birds, Beads and Destinies. And it's a, a book that you read to your kids about, about sex, about the Amazing. good, healthy version of sex. Okay. Right. And so they bought my book and they were now telling me the story. And they decided we're going to sit all our kids on the bed, mom, dad, the whole family, and we're going to read this book. You know, it might be the first time for the little one, the older one, we've already spoken about sex, but it will cover some bases, whatever. So they read it. And then the middle, the, the, the child who was in grade six, he was at an all boys private uh, primary school. And so his question was, but dad, how does the penis get into the vagina? So then they had to talk about erections and, mm -hmm. you know, all of the and arousal and we went, oh, dad, so that's what a boner is. <laughs> and, <laughs> and his dad is like, yes. But the reality is if that family hadn't had that conversation, that yeah. boy would have got, got a Googled boner. Yeah. And can you imagine what he yeah. would have come up with? Yeah, oh, that is. He would have. It would have so been two clicks before the, the the most depraved pornography came onto yes. his phone. Especially if his parents did not have software to protect yes. his phone, um, or had had warned him about that. And so we we actually cannot 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 sit it out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I actually say to parents, it's unfair of you to expect your children to do this by themselves. Mm -hmm. um, you have an immature brain. You have normal curiosity. Mm -hmm. You have peer pressure. And then you have the internet yeah. that has no filters, has everything there. And so when parents say to me, I don't check my child's phone because I trust them and they're 12 years old, <laughs> I say to them, it's not about trust. Mm -hmm. It's about maturity. It's about you are you are actually being incredibly unfair to your child by putting that kind of weight of responsibility on them. Mm -hmm. Because then you know what happens is like that little girl who sat in my office the shame that they feel because of what they mm. watched, like they chose it somehow, mm. that then they have to carry that shame and then you have to deal with that. Um, and that's not fair. I agree so much with the shame part of it because when I ask kids, um, in my one workshop, I ask kids, have you ever seen something online that you wish you never saw? And the amount of hands that go it's always about 85 percent of the group have seen something that they wish they never saw but then when you ask them and did you of you that have seen something who did you tell they haven't told anyone no because they're ashamed because they think they are to blame for having stumbled mm. upon whatever it is they stumbled upon and that actually yeah. brings me to my next question and it is at what age do we need to have that first conversation about pornography in particular? Um, because we know that in South Africa, most kids are given smartphones now at the age of 10. So if you're going to give your child a smartphone at the age of 10, at what age do you need to be speaking about pornography to be their first mm -hmm. encounter with pornography as opposed to it being on the phone? Yeah. And you've got to remember that even even if they're getting a smartphone at 10, they've probably already had an iPad. 
they've had um, an Xbox, they've had a PlayStation, they've had a laptop where there's so much pornography as well. So mm. just thinking that the phone is the only source of pornography. And also, even if they don't have phones, their friends Great. have phones, you know, yeah. like my son, he wasn't exposed to that nude on his own phone. He was exposed yeah. to it on a teammate's Phone. Yes, and that so is um, such a big concern uh, because it's the second hand yeah. smoke it's the second hand smoke we can protect our kids and say uh, you don't smoke you you're not allowed to smoke like this is the dangers of smoking mm. and talk about smoking but then when they sit uh, at a friend's party and there's an ipad that doesn't have any filtering software on it they will get exposed to that second hand smoke and there's nothing yeah. we can do to control it and that's why even if you don't give your child a phone at age 10 you still have to have that conversation but what age yeah. do we have the pornography so, discussion? <laughs> so the thing is, um, it's changing all the time. Um, so like I said, it's the best the best case scenario is they learn about sex before they learn about porn. And the perfect window of opportunity to talk about sex is seven to nine. Okay. So that is when they are cognitively ready to, and, and I'm talking sexual intercourse, okay? You're, you're, and we can maybe have a conversation around this another day, but your conversations about sex start when they're two and you accurately name the body parts and you talk about body autonomy and you talk about all those good things. But the actual sexual intercourse, sexual intimacy conversation happens between seven and nine. And I would err uh, closer to seven than nine if, okay. if the average age is, of exposure is 10. But then... Um, some some advocates that I speak to, when I say advocates, I mean advocates of, of healthy sexualities. They're saying five or six because to, about sex because they're saying pornography exposure is so early now mm. that you have to get in with the good version before they're exposed to the bad version. Mm. So that those are kind of some guidelines. But even if you don't, you know, your conversations about porn are graded as well. So a five-year-old child who, who who watches YouTube, you can have a conversation about porn with them in saying that, um, remember mom and dad said bodies are private, um, naked bodies should not be shown to other people, but some silly people put naked pictures onto the internet. Okay, okay. So that's a different conversation. Yeah. Um, and so that's that's still a porn conversation. Mm, it's just graded mm. the child's age. Um, there's there's uh, I've written a book called Well Connected, which is kind of aimed at older kids. But there's some beautiful books called Good Pictures, Bad Pictures. I'm sure you've come yeah. across them. Yeah. And there's one for smaller kids, um, and then there's one for older kids. And then there's another excellent book called um, Keeping Safe with Carl the Kingfish, okay. which actually talks about um, the internet as the ocean. Okay. And they speak about pornography in that book. And it's also aimed at this five, six kind of age group uh, where it's age appropriate information. Um, because here's the thing that parents get so wrong all the time. They, they think that when I talk to my child about sex, I rob them of their innocence. It's just not true. Mm -hmm. Talking about sex in an age appropriate way with your child protects their innocence yes. like few other things will. Like you're saying, if, you're, if you've spoken to your child about what sex is and what it's meant to be, and you've spoken to them about that sometimes people distort it and put it onto the internet, then when they're sitting at that birthday party and you've always said to them, my boy, when you see something like that on the screen, and my mantra that I always tell kids, get up, walk away, tell a trusted adult. Mm. So you leave that screen behind, you close mm. it. I tell them not to delete it because I think parents need to help them with whatever the content they was. But if you give them that thing, like, and that's what equipped my son next to the hockey field, is he got up, he walked away, and as soon as he got in the car, he told his sister, and then I got in the car and he told me, and we could have a conversation about it. And he was and empowered. So, he was empowered because he had so the knowledge. Yeah. So empowered. And, and, and so also, so we don't actually have to have those explicit conversations that we've had now with that. I mean we don't no. I don't I don't even talk to my teenage kids about no, that. No. But we can give them the basics and give them the tools. Yes. And then they are equipped for whatever it is that they run into. But what is exciting for me about the way you've told the story is that there was a soft landing place for him. So I often see that in households where these conversations are taboo and we don't speak about it at all. The, the child doesn't have the confidence to actually go and tell the parent when they are in that situation. And, and so when these open discussions is part of your household, does that not sort of create this sort of mattress 
of when it does happen, there's a soft landing space. You can come and tell me at home, nothing is taboo here. Here we speak about things. Is, is, that, mm. is that accurate? Um, it's so accurate. And I think that soft landing space has to exist whether they looked for the content and they were responsible, they actually sought it out or they were accidentally yeah. exposed yeah. Um, because they're children yeah. and they're learning. And they need to know, because a lot of, and, and also um, that we're going to respond in a life-giving positive way. Because I, I don't know if you ever follow up your question with, did you tell anyone? With, why didn't you tell anyone? I'm sure you do. But a lot of the thing is they'll take my phone. Um, you know, the one boy said, ma'am, my, my mom will kill me. Then she'll take away my phone and then she'll come back to make sure I was dead. Oh. That was his answer to me. <laughs> <laughs> that's the trouble he would get in if he had been watching that mm -hmm. and so they would rather not tell because of this extreme and it often i find often in the space we parent out of fear like because it is it is the most awful thing to experience when your child is exposed to this thing especially if they've sorted out or even worse they've been watching it yeah, ongoingly um you know to be able to absorb that and just say to them thank you so much for telling me we we are going to figure this out together because families that i speak to who have gone through that journey they come out stronger on the other yes, side absolutely they absolutely. really do yes but we have to be brave enough to journey through it, and which what, is ugly and hard. What advice would you give a parent whose child watches pornography regularly? I mean, what do you do in that situation? Uh, so obviously it would depend on how often, when they're watching it, where they're watching it. You know, uh, one of the, the, the most empowering things you can say to your children is that when they see pornography, part of their brain will like it. Mm -hmm. um, and that takes a lot of the power out of it because the shame comes in often with, mm -hmm. I liked it. Yes. Even though I was shocked by it, my brain liked it. And it was what it is, is that huge surge of dopamine that yes. hits the pleasure center of the brain that happens. I mean, you know how these things work. It, it works exactly like all other drugs. Mm -hmm. um, and so when that dopamine hit comes, there's a lot of shock and it's almost like watching a car wreck kind of, deer in the headlights and then you, your body can even respond physically you know these a lot of boys are getting sextorted now that you know they're getting yes. you know catfished and stuff because when they get sent that nude they're like whoa they're excited this girl likes me yes. and this girl's hot and i'm enjoying what i'm seeing and so because their prefrontal cortex is underdeveloped and their amygdala is just like screaming you know with all of this it passion good, and yes. like desire yeah which is normal it's normal yeah, it's, so it's, normal. it's what's supposed to happen in your mm -hmm. body but because of the underdeveloped prefrontal cortex and no safety in it they get sucked into it yes. and so um i think the first thing i would do is is number one i would i would have conversations about why it is so dangerous and harmful um how they got drawn in there and some of the lies that they are believing about yes. sex yes. and then i would have conversations about sex about the fact that sex is supposed to be the most intimate way that two people who are consenting mm -hmm and want to be there, connect with one another. It's supposed to be the deepest human experience. Mm -hmm. And so having sex by yourself in your bedroom while you're watching an iPhone is the antithesis of, that. of the beautiful gift of sex. Yeah. And, and obviously these conversations have to happen without shame while they allow the neuro pathways of their brain to regrow. Uh, one of the first things you need to do is get them off TikTok, mm -hmm. specifically TikTok, Reddit, um, and Discord, um, and if they're on Twitter, which some teenagers are, but those are like the hotspots. Mm -hmm. And then you need to have open conversations about where they're exposed. Mm -hmm. And they'll only have those open conversations if they know that you are wanting to help them. Mm -hmm. um, and so you, you talk about what they were exposed to, how it made them feel, um, how much they've been exposed to, mm. how often they've been watching. Because there's a difference between watching pornography and being addicted to pornography. There's a big difference between those two things. And, and one is much easier to, to yeah. retrain and rewire the brain. And then the other one is um, a lot harder. You might need, um, you know, you might need professional intervention, yeah. those kinds of things. And then lots of positive conversations about why sex is worth protecting. 
Mm. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's, you know, some, some of the conversations, for example, are pre-internet porn, erectile dysfunction sat at about 5% of men in their 20s. It's now sitting at 33%. So we have all of these men who are unable to have good, healthy, wonderful sex uh, with their partners because of what was happening. And, and to kind of negate that narrative of it's what boys do, you know, boys need to masturbate often so that they can stay healthy because otherwise the, the absurd, I mean, there's ridiculous videos on social media about if boys don't masturbate, the, 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 the sperm goes toxic inside them and gives them blue balls. It's actually scientifically complete rubbish. But our, our sons are watching these things online mm. and absorbing that these, this is, so kind of you have to speak against the narrative, yeah, the again, the Trojan horse that is, mm. is hiding the truth about porn from our children and empowering yeah. them. And then obviously their devices. We have to make sure their devices are safe, talk to them about software, um, talk to them about until they feel stronger, until they feel um that they are, and obviously depends on the age, yes. um, that those devices have good software, nudity detection, um, filters that do not allow them on porn sites, um, you know, give them age appropriate access to social media, mm -hmm. those kinds of things. Just, you know, because those are the shark nets, the yes. seat belt, the things that we're supposed to put in, in place in our children's lives to keep them safe while they are growing into their brains and into their mm -hmm. adulthood. Christy, I think that is, that's amazing. That's amazing. The shark net, the filtering software, putting the stops in place where we can, um, I think is so important. Um, but the one thing that I am very curious to know, and this is something that I haven't been able to pin down. What is the link between online games and pornography? Because I've heard that it is a slippery slope for boys. Yo, that is such an interesting question. Um, there are, so there's a couple of links. Number one is that they, that often gaming is a gateway into um, pornography through various ways. Like I said, on Roblox, there is a version of the game where you can literally watch characters of the game having sex. And then obviously that leads to other other forms of pornography. The second one is it is a way that sexual predators connect with our children. Mm -hmm. And those sexual predators pose as other children and use pornography to groom our kids. Yes. And then the third one is people who, sexual groomers, older children who want to sexualize our children, use the game as bait to sexualize our children. So there was a little boy um, I was talking to the other day, he's 14 now, but this happened to him when he was nine is um, this guy on, on um, Fortnite, he said to them, have you heard of this specific rule in Fortnite? It was rule and a, a number, 30, I'll say 34, I can't remember what it was. Have you heard of rule 34 um, uh, Fortnite? And this, this rule will help you level up in the game, it'll get you V-Bucks, because you know, boys are always yes. looking at leveling yes. up yes. and yes. all of that. And so he said, no, I haven't. So he said, go and Google it. So basically what this rule is, it's, it's nothing to do with Fortnite. It, it is a, a rule of the internet that if something exists on the internet, a porn equivalent exists of that thing. Mm -hmm. So basically when he Googled rule 34 Fortnite, what came up was Fortnite porn. Uh. And so, um, yeah. And then a couple of other things is the, the, the conversations um, that are had. So the language yes. is appalling a lot of the time on gaming no, it's and insane. actually the, the treatment of girls and women in the gaming world is terrible. Mm -hmm. So girls are objectified, they are spoken down to, they are belittled. And so again, it's perpetuating that thing of men being in charge and women being Submissive. second rate citizens, being submitted, submissive, which is actually what goes on um, in, in porn. In porn. Yeah. And so there's, there's lots of links between the two and also um, the highly addictive nature, the fact that often you're on a device for long periods of time without an adult around, mm -hmm. um, that boredom factor, that extended use factor. So there's lots of like links between mm -hmm. the two where um, they, they kind of can feed into, one can feed into the other. 
And do you think that because if you are, if you've got gaming disorder, you've got a bit of a, not a bit, but you've got a dopamine dependency. So you need to go back to get more dopamine and you need to find a loot box to spike the dopamine or whatever it is. Um, do you think that because pornography also spikes dopamine, that it's, it's an easy transition because you're already yeah. dependent on dopamine? Yeah, and you're looking for dopamine fixes. Yes, okay. That's, yeah, that's so definitely. Okay, and um, then I want to ask you if you can whisper one, one sentence, one piece of advice. Into, I mean, you've worked with hundreds of kids and hundreds of parents, and you've seen it all. If you could whisper one piece of advice into the ear of every parent, what would you say? Um, it's a bit of a long sentence, but I would say, do not give your children smartphones or social media until high school at all. The tiny little bit of social cred you think it's giving your child is not worth the mountain of stuff that they are going to have to deal with. I speak to teenager after teenager after teenager who says, what were my parents thinking, giving me access to that stuff in primary school? Oh. The stuff I had to see, the drama I had to deal with, it just wasn't worth it. And then when you do give your children access to these things, please, please be very, very present with them. Yeah. Be right by their side. And then as they grow in maturity, as they grow in confidence, as they grow in responsibility, as they grow in age, you can start to take steps away and you can start to distance yourself until they are walking strong in their own ability to be a, a safe, wise, kind digital user. But don't expect them to do it on their own and don't expect them to do it really young because they just can't. And it's a lot to expect of a child. No, and, and I agree with you. I, and I think um, that the industry is against us. They're, the industry is against them. Um, yeah. uh, you've got a billion dollar industry that is against your child. Um, like you yeah. said, you know, they're even trying to change the labels of a pedophile to what was it? Minor attracted people. Wow. So they're attracted to minors. And that is to create a, a I don't know, a PC version of mm. pedophilia? Mm. Pedophilia, yeah. That blows my mind. I I mean, yeah. if there's one thing that I want that that I've like that will stand out in this interview for me for the rest of my life, it'll be that. I, I can't believe that we're trying to create an acceptable category for mm. what is essentially illegal. Yeah. But if you look at if you look at pornography, like you said, what was pornography when we were young is now on Netflix. Yes. So so Game of Thrones, Fifty Shades of Grey, if you'd if you had if you'd made that when when I was a teenager, it would have it would have been pornography. So that so it's just that the boundary just keeps getting pushed. And yeah. so now we're here where we're beating women, slapping them, hurting them and filming it is so normal and so bland so then what's next there always has to be because it's so such a dark it's such a evil horrible ugly mm. point of the, the whole industry it's just got to keep going Jeez. you know you know so if there's always going to be something more extreme yeah, that is normal i feel that if it wasn't for people like you who were standing up and saying this out loud and not being afraid to um, to be honest about what's happening, then where would we be? I, I mean, we need to be able to have these conversations. Um, okay, now one more question I've got for you is, so whenever we have guests um, and we do an interview, we allow the guest to leave a question for the next guest. And last, year, uh, last week we actually interviewed um, Mrs. Hilary Goldberg, um, who's the principal at Theodore Herzl Primary, and she left a question for you. And the question is, what small habits can families instill in their day-to-day -day lives to spend more time connecting with one another? One meal a day at the table. Yes. And no phones in the car or at the dinner table. I love in the car. I love in the car because... You know, I grew up in Johannesburg and we sat in the traffic for 45 minutes and back then there were no phones. 
And I'm, I've got a very close bond with my mom, but I think it's because we sat for 45 minutes. And you know what? Even if you're a grumpy teenager, if you've been sitting for 10 minutes next to someone, it gets a bit awkward not to say a single word. So eventually your yeah. day spills out. So I love yeah. the in the car one. And you know what else is sometimes there's things that you can't look at your mom in the face and talk about. And in the car, you don't have to because you're both looking straight ahead. Yeah. And awkward conversations can happen in the car. Yeah. You know, I, I always... I always joke with my with my my daughter's very open, but my sons are they're typical teenage boys. They don't really want to have these deep conversations with their mom. And so if there's something, <clears throat> sorry, if there's something like a bit awkward I want to talk to them about, I wait until five minutes away from our house. Okay. <clears throat> and um I say, boys, I just want to talk to you about this. And it's so perfect because they know it's only gonna last five minutes. So they engage. <laughs> And I know they're captive. They can't, they're, unless they're going to jump out on the freeway, they have to listen to me. They can't like go, oh, God, close, stop talking. And so good to well. Like you just have those short, sharp, like little, like, you know, I've seen this, I've heard this. What do you think of this? Um, you know, have your friends spoken about this? You know, those kinds of quick conversations that don't often happen when you, you know, face to face, you can have those. And I, we have had some amazing conversations in the car. And like you said, just time together. Have some good music on, you know, a few years ago, we, we, cause our kids would always fight. They've all got very different tastes in music. So now everyone has a day. Okay. Like, and cause we have three, cause we have three kids that each have two days and my husband and I have one. <laughs> oh, nice. we, where they choose the music, they play their music, they connect um, to the Bluetooth. And again, they have to put their music on and then put their phone away. And, um, and then we chat. That's and so you have some nice music playing. You, you know, we also, we live a little bit out of town. So we spend a fair amount of time in the car and it's mm. such good times. That's amazing. I love that. No phones in the car. I love that. I'm going to even do that myself. I need to, I need to get in the habit of putting my phone in the boot when I've got the kids in the car. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. And then uh, what question would you like to leave the next guest that we interview? Mm, this is such a hard hard thing to do um, and I gave it some thought and what I thought is you know sometimes we're quite hard on teenagers and we often criticize them but I think my question for your next guest is what is what is one of the things that teenagers do so much better than us <laughs> okay I love that question it's a very <laughs> because there's one. lots yes there is lots there is so that's <laughs> that's so true Again, I like that. <laughs> They're amazing. Teenagers are awesome. Resourceful. <laughs> very resourceful. Yeah. Very resourceful. <laughs> very kind yeah. sometimes. <laughs> I love that. Thank you, Kirsty. I, I really, really appreciate the work that you're doing. You know, I often, I often feel that the work that I do make me very unpopular. Um, I'm, I'm definitely, you know, if, when you're the person that advocates for less screen time, you're never the most popular person in the room, <laughs> that's for sure. And so I really appreciate to um, have another person that's a warrior mom, that's fighting for something that's probably not the easy way, but that is the right way. Um, and yeah, thank you for being a wholesome, healthy influence. Um, I think it's so difficult, the world that we live in, we are almost curators of childhood. We need to look after and protect childhood. And um, I really appreciate that you are protecting childhood and, and, and fighting for our kids to have a childhood and to remain children for as long as they need to. Yeah, it's such a pleasure. I think you said in, in your first email, we need more singers in this choir. <laughs> um, and I love that, is that it, it's so exciting when I, you know, get to meet someone who feels this passionately about this generation. Um, and, you know, we're, we're not here to, to be party poopers. We're here to help a generation live huge, beautiful, powerful, mm. abundant lives. Absolutely. And that their phones and their screen time adds to that, not yes. um, not draws them away from, from the beauty that is their lives, yes. you know? And so thank you for fighting <laughs> and thank you for having me. No. It's always you know, such a privilege to speak to someone who shares your heart for, um, mm. for the world and for um, this beautiful next generation. So it's been an absolute privilege and I've loved every minute of it. Thank you. It was such an eye opener. I, um, yeah, I've learned so much. I'm going to need some time to process now, but wow, I've learned so <laughs> much. So thank you. 
Yeah, and then I think just to say to parents, I know that sometimes after conversations like this, we can feel shaken, yeah. we can feel rattled, we can feel overwhelmed. Um, but honestly, if we if we stay just stay connected, do little things, um, and honestly, I think probably like you and I both believe, make your home a place. Um, of connection, make it a place where your children can ask you anything. And that's, that's probably, um, you know, take, take time away from some of the urgent things to invest in these important things. Put down our phones, yeah. um, look at, at the beautiful faces of our children. And honestly, you know, there's, if, if our children feel safe with us, I think we can make it through anything. Oh, I love that. That's so empowering. Thank you. Such a pleasure. Awesome. Thank you for having me. It's been wonderful. No, that's great. Thank you, Kirsty.